Emma. Oh, my. In the fall of 1832, Emma was expecting their fourth child, and, well, you know how difficult a time that can be for an expectant mother. <laughs> so Joseph wrote to her from New York City. Dear Emma, this day I have been walking through the most splendid part of the city, but thoughts of home and of Emma and Julia rush upon my mind like a flood, and I could wish for a moment to be with you. I feel to say something to you concerning your peculiar trial and present affliction. I hope God will give you strength, for I know your state and others do not. But you must comfort yourself knowing that God is your friend in heaven, and that you have one true and living friend here on earth, your husband, Joseph Smith, Jr. Oh, isn't that lovely? Very faithful. And when tensions in Kirtland forced Joseph to leave temporarily, she wrote to him. My dear husband, I cannot attempt to tell you my feelings when I found I could not see you before you left. The children feel very anxious about you because they don't know where you have gone. I verily feel if I had no more confidence in God than some I could name, I should be in a sad case indeed. But I still believe if we are as faithful as we can be, we shall be delivered from every snare. Oh, but there were snares aplenty. Perhaps Joseph's most difficult trial was his unjust incarceration in Liberty Jail. And oh, the irony of that name. Confined through a bitter winter without even basic necessities, Joseph was powerless to assist Emma or the other saints as we were now driven out of Missouri with their little children clinging to her skirts and Joseph's papers and sacks tied around her waist. Emma crossed the frozen Mississippi alone. But they were together in their letters and this is one you must hear. It's dated November the 4th, 1838. My dear and beloved companion, in tribulation and affliction, I want to inform you that I am well and that we and all of us are in good spirits. We've been escorted by the Jackson County boys in a most genteel manner and arrived here in the midst of a splendid parade. <laughs> Humorous despite tribulation. What God may do for us, I do not know, but I hope for the best. Though I go unto death, I will trust in him. Dear husband, I shall not attempt to write my feelings all together for the situation in which you are. The walls, bars, bolts, running rivers, rolling streams, rising hills, sinking valleys, and spreading prairies that separate us, and the cruel injustice which first cast you into prison, and still holds you there. I can only pray for deliverance until it is meted out, and take everything as it comes with patience and fortitude. Oh God, grant that I might have the privilege of seeing once more my lovely family. Tell the children that I am alive and trust <coughs> that I will come to see them before long. Tell little Joseph that he must be a good boy. Tell Frederick's father loves him with all his heart. Tell Julia and all the rest that they are on my mind continually. We are well at present, except Frederick who is quite sick. Little Alexander is one of the finest fellows you ever saw in your life. He is so strong that with the assistance of a chair, he will run all around the room. <laughs> I have many more things I would like to write. However, if God will spare my life once more for the privilege of taking care of you, I will ease your care and endeavor to comfort your heart do not forsake me nor the truth. If I do not see you again in this life, may God grant that we may meet in heaven. No one but God knows the reflections of my mind and the feelings of my heart when I left our house and home and almost all we possessed except our little children and took my journey out of the state of misery, leaving you shut up that lonesome prison. The recollection 
He is more than human nature ought to bear. You want to know how much I want to see you. Examine your own feelings. How much do you want to see me? I would gladly walk from here to you, barefooted, bareheaded, and half naked, and consider it a great pleasure. <laughs> I feel like Joseph in Egypt. Does my family yet live? If they do live, do they remember me? Have they regard for me? If so, let me know it. Yes, Joseph. I still live and am yet willing to suffer more. If it is the will of kind heaven that I should, for your sake. But I hope there are better days to come to us yet. I have never seen a woman in my life who would endure every species of fatigue and hardship from month to month and year to year, which is a Hebrew word meaning beautiful place. But we now call it the city of Joseph in his honor. The city thrived with the influx of new converts, and Joseph often preached in the grove on Sundays that we were all strengthened and respected by his words. There were fans so attentive to my needs, even more so after his father, my cherished companion, Joseph Sr., passed away. Well, forgive the wool gathering of an old woman. Joseph had to spend quite a lot of time in hiding now to avoid being illegally arrested and taken back to Missouri. Dear Emma, I embrace this opportunity this morning to express to you some of my feelings. First of all, I take the liberty to tender my sincere thanks for your two interesting and consoling visits you made to me in almost my exile situation. Tongue cannot express the gratitude of my heart for your true and warm-hearted friendship that you have manifest toward me. Last night, Brother Hiram and others came to see me. They think that I would be safer at a little distance off for the time being. If I go to the pine country, the new shall come along with me. For I am not willing to put you in the hands of those that do not feel the same interest for you that I feel. I think that if I could have a respite of about six months with my family, it would be the savor of life unto life. Nevertheless, if it be possible, I would like to live here in peace. Dear husband, I am ready to go with you if you are obliged to leave. I shall make the best arrangements I can and be as well prepared as possible. Tell the children it is well with their father as yet, and that he remains in fervent prayer to Almighty God for the safety of himself, for them, and for you. Tell Mother Smith it shall be well with her son, whether in life or in death. For thus saith the Lord God. And tell Hiram to be sure and not to fail in carrying out my instructions. Yours in haste, your affectionate husband until death, for all eternity and evermore, Joseph Smith. Hiram says he will go with me, but still, I feel a good confidence that you can be protected without leaving this vicinity. If it is pleasant weather, I shall contrive to see you this evening, but dare not run too much of a risk. Yours. Affectionately forever, Emma Smith. Even though Joseph had to be ready to hide at a moment's notice, he wrote to his wife from Carthage Jail. Dear Emma, I am very much resigned to my lot, knowing that I am justified and have done the best that could be done. Give my love to the children and all my friends. God bless you all. Amen. You have heard, I am sure, the events of that fateful day. The mob that stormed the jail, the brothers slain. My sons, oh, the prophet and the patriarch. Joseph could not deny what he knew to be true, nor would I have ever wanted him to. I can still see him, that fair-haired boy of 14, with a conviction 
I will never doubt. I can hear him even now. I had actually he seen a light. And in the midst of that light, I saw two persons. And they did, in reality, speak to me. And though I have been hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. I knew it. And I know that God knows it. And I cannot deny it. Nor did Emma ever deny it. Though they were often separated by circumstances, their hearts were ever one. How I wept when I learned you would never again in this life come home to us, to me and to our children. In your stead, Brother Green came. He blessed me with peace, protection, and resignation. But when I asked him why you had been taken from us, he could only assure me that the sorrow I bore would be the crown of my life. Oh, Joseph, what does he know? It is not the sorrow of your loss, but of you. You, my dear husband, are my crown. How glorious were my thoughts when on the 11th of August, 1842, in my exile, I took the hand once more of my beloved Emma, the wife of my youth, the choice of my heart. Many were my thoughts when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes that we've been called to pass through, the fatigues and toils, the sorrows and sufferings, the joys and consolations. Oh, what a commingling of thoughts filled my mind for a moment. Again, she is here, even in the seventh trouble, undaunted, firm, and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. Preserve her soul in perfect peace from sickness of